information that I'm about to share with you, I've never seen anywhere else. I'm sure there are other people out there aware of this information, but I've never seen it shared before. It comes from years of studying, experimenting with, and building permanent magnet motive force systems. There are three types of permanent magnetic motors. I'm not going to get into electromagnetics or kinetic energy devices. I'm simply referring to permanent magnet motive force systems. And the thing that might surprise a lot of people is that there is one man that was not only aware of these three systems, but is also the only person I'm aware of that holds patents in all three magnetic motor systems. That man is Howard Johnson. The three types of magnetic motor systems are imbalanced system, which is the most common, the induction expulsion system, and the exchange force pulse system. Each of these systems can be built in linear or rotary motor assemblies. I will cover all three of the types, what they are, how they work, how to test an assembly to see if it functions correctly in subsequent videos. In this video I will be focusing on imbalanced systems. The parent dev motor. Gilmer Yeltitz magnetic motor. James Roney shielded stator magnetic motor. The Vigay motor. And Howard Johnson's most famous magnetic motor, which was featured in Science and Mechanics. What do they all have in common? They are all imbalanced systems or spin alignment systems. Now what exactly is an imbalanced system and how does it work? It is a magnetic assembly that imbalances the cogging effect created by the electron spins of the magnets in close proximity to each other. Whether it be the fields between the track magnets and a cart or stator array and rotor. This is done by careful creation of spin alignment patterns by use of correct spacing, shielding, distance and location between the assemblies of magnets. It may employ different types of magnets and types of shielding material in complex geometric assemblies. It often requires precise measurement and spacing and exact dimensional assembly of complex magnetic patterns. This is the whole theory behind designs like the Perenet motor and the science of systems like Howard Johnson's most famous magnetic motor design. In order for a design like this to work, there has to be an arrangement of magnets that can be effectively looped together for continuous rotation. The best way to test an assembly is by first building a flat track version of the design. By starting with a linear assembly, you exclude certain complex variables that you will have to compensate for in a rotary assembly. When you build a rotary assembly, you have to compensate for flux loops that are created by arcing an arrangement of magnets into a circle the magnetic variances of the backside of your rotor magnets affecting the opposite side of your stator, if they are on the interior wall of the motor, the effect that the metal from the shielding material has on your entire assembly, etc. So it's very important to understand what you're looking for in a linear assembly in order to ensure that you actually have a design that can be used to build an imbalanced system. Knowing is half the battle and will save you hours of wasted time and money. If you pay close attention to what I'm about to share with you, you will fully understand how to spot a design that can be used to build a working magnetic motor based on this design type. You'll also easily be able to spot configurations that can't. You'll be able to easily distill through designs that other people post and know whether it's something useful to experiment with or simply a fun distraction. One of the core misunderstandings in building magnetic motor systems is that when somebody comes up with an idea that works well in a small assembly, they think it's possible to arc the geometry of it and make a rotary assembly. It's always wise to test your ideas in a linear track before taking the time to try building a complex rotary assembly. This assembly is based on a patent by George Sukup. Sukup based his design on the Robert Calloway V-Gate even though he takes credit and calls it the Suka V-Gate on his patent. This video clip is a test of his design using a linear track. You'll notice that they used three successions of V-Gates and left the holes at the end of the assembly where they could have put a fourth. There's a very good reason for that. I'll explain in this miniaturized version using the exact same configuration. 
The importance of lengthening the track is to ensure that the configuration you're testing really works. For example, this V-gate assembly works well through the first two successions of V-gates, but it begins to slow in the third, and it fails in the fourth. So there would be no point in building a rotary version of this configuration of the V-gate because it simply won't work. That's not to say that there's not a configuration of the V-gate that won't work, but this one will not. Most magnetic assemblies exhibit something I refer to as the spring effect. Now magnets are not like springs. I hear that analogy all the time, and people who use it often don't have a really strong understanding of magnetic fields. Regardless, many tracks exhibit the spring effect. Once you push past the area of repulsion at the entrance of the track, a cart or rotor will shoot through the track and out the other end. Don't fall into the trap of being too excited about achieving this effect. Often, when you extend the track, you will notice that the spring effect reaches a certain point in the track where it's really just winding down. What your track must do in order to work in an arc geometry is to be able to start a cart at various points and still travel successfully out the other end. If it fails to do so, or is drawn right back into the track at the exit point, then there is no need to build a rotary version. It just won't work. If you build a long track and there's a dead zone right in the middle of the track, then it also won't work in a rotary assembly. A simple rule of thumb that I've discovered is, if you're combining or looping a particular configuration, whether it's a V8 or one of Howard Johnson's styled configurations, put together at least five or six of these in a flat track. If you can pass through all five or six without the cart noticeably slowing down or stopping, then you may have something definitely build and test a rotary assembly. Consistent, consecutive motion is the goal. Without that, you have only a clever pile of magnets arranged in an interesting way that accomplishes very little more than to entertain. Because in a rotary version, the magnets are all lined up in a row. You won't have the advantage of starting at the opening of a succession of magnets and shooting out the other end unless you build the assembly separately and generate enough motive force to jump from one magnetic assembly to the next without slowing. It's okay to have dead zones, which are areas that a cart or rotor will stop dead in a track or stator assembly, so long as you can move the cart or rotor into a motive force zone, which is an area of the track or stator where it begins to move and continues in a forward momentum through every dead zone without stopping or stalling. So in summary, a magnetic assembly that accelerates a cart through a track does not necessarily qualify as an imbalanced or spin alignment system. In a true imbalanced system, a cart or rotor can be stopped and restarted at various places along a magnetic assembly or stator, and it will still accelerate to the end of the track, or will consistently rotate in a rotary system. There can be areas of magnetic flux that create dead zones in the track so long as motive force zones of movement balance the system out and cause it to coast past the dead zones. The best imbalance system will exhibit no dead zones though, even when you build an extended track. When you see an assembly that functions this way, even when you restart the rotor or cart at any point in the assembly and it still works, you know it's a true imbalance system. Thanks for watching. Join me next time when I'll cover the second type of permanent magnet motor force system, the exchange force pulse system. Do great things.